Hello everyone, I am Leandro Soares Indruziak from the Real-Time Systems Group at the University of York and it is my pleasure to give the keynote at the SBESC 2020 conference. I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk about schedulability-driven optimization of real-time systems. This is the outline of my talk. I will introduce the problem of optimizing cyber physical systems and how we can use schedulability tests to do so. The talk will have an introduction to schedulability tests for those of you that don't know the basics and would like to know a little bit more. And then I'll use that to explain how can we optimize cyber physical real time embedded systems at the computation communication and physical process level using schedulability tests as a guide. And the final contribution of the talk will be uh, an overview on the semi-automatic synthesis of such tests in case we don't have them ready, readily available for optimization. So our focus here, as I've mentioned, is on real-time cyber physical systems, which for the sake of this talk are interconnected systems where interactions with physical processes are controlled by computing infrastructure. And those interactions have hard or soft real-time constraints at computation, communication, and process level. And those constraints and the ability of the system to respect those constraints has an impact on the usability, safety, and the security requirements of such systems. The research challenge that we are addressing is to design and optimize such systems so that they can meet those real-time constraints at computation, communication, and process level. As an example, as constraints at the computation level, they include the deadlines on the execution of tasks over multiple processors, the transfers of data to and from memory, they all have to happen within timing constraints. Communication level includes the exchanges of messages over wired or wireless networks that are putting the system together over a distributed environment. And at the process level, it's related to the deadlines and timing constraints that we'll have for the delivery of re relevant information and goods over the actual plant that the embedded and real-time systems are trying to control. So let's take a look in general at the optimization process. For us, an optimization process takes as an input a model of the system and an initial configuration of the system. And the goal of this optimization is to produce a configuration that is better than the original configuration that we have. And we would use some optimization engine to do that. There are many, many ways to do it. And in my research, I'm considering optimization en engines that are composed by a search heuristic that is guided by schedulability tests. The search heuristic can be an evolutionary algorithm. It can be a simulated annealing algorithm. It can be some taboo search. It can be particle swarm optimization. This choice is beyond the scope of this talk. I will use examples based on genetic and evolutionary algorithms because I have more experience and I have worked more in that direction. But nothing in this talk constrains the work to that particular kind of search. We can use any other search heuristic there. The focus of the talk is on the schedulability tests that actually guide the search. And that's what we are going to look into more detail. A real-time system is considered to be schedulable when all its real-time requirements can be met, even in the worst case. And going back to the basics, we'll see that the schedulability of a system will depend at least on the properties of the tasks that are running in this system, the type and amount of resources that are used by those tasks, and the scheduling algorithm that is used by the system. And let's take a concrete example. Let's see, as an example, an event-driven single processor system, a very sim simple system seen as a set of n independent sporadic tasks, which are characterized by their period or minimum interactivation interval, the deadline, which the time by which they have to be 
finished and the worst case execution time if it's using the resources by itself without any sharing with the resource with anybody else. And in this example, our resources are a single processor, a single CPU. And we assume that those tasks will be scheduled according to a rate monotonic scheduling. So tasks with a smaller period will have higher priority. And an example of such system is an engine control system like the one in, in the figure where we have sensors which can be uh, measuring the position of the fuel pedal, the RPM, the rotations per minute of uh, the engine, the temperature, and the actuators could be the actuator controlling the volume for the fuel injection or the activation time for the spark plugs. Those systems are commonly implemented as a single processor system and in the picture we have an actual engine control system from an automotive vendor that we have worked with in the past. The system then is considered to be schedulable, as I've said, when all tasks always meet the respective deadlines, even in the worst case. How can we guarantee that? That's where schedulability tests play a role. A schedulability test, as I said, depends on a system model, which includes the task set and their properties, the resources in the system, and the chosen scheduling algorithm. And the schedulability test will do, for a given configuration, it will provide a decision whether that particular configuration will make the system schedulable. As I've mentioned, the schedulability test has to be custom made for a given system model. For every different system model, we'll have to have different schedulability tests. So we assume at this part of the talk that for a given system model, we have a schedulability test. And when do we use it? We can use it at design time to make those guarantees based on what we know that the system will have in terms of tasks and their properties, resources and scheduling algorithm and a given configuration. Or if any of those things changes during runtime, we have a much more complex task in our hands and we have actually to apply the schedulability test during runtime. What kind of schedulability tests are out, out there in terms of tightness? We have three kinds. We have sufficient, necessary, and exact schedulability tests. Let's look into a little bit more detail on those classifications. And for that, I ask you to imagine that for a given system, this rectangle here shows all possible configurations for a system. And in this rectangle here, we have the set of schedulable system configurations, meaning those configurations where my system will always meet its deadlines, even in the worst case. Typically, I don't know where that rectangle is. That central rectangle there is completely unknown, and that's why I need the schedulability tests to guide me towards that area of my set of possible configurations. If my test is able to differentiate between system configurations that are not schedulable, meaning the ones that are outside the dashed line, and configurations that may be schedulable but may not be schedulable, which are inside of the dashed line. This is a necessary schedulability test. So if a particular configuration passes a necessary schedulability test, we don't really know if it will be schedulable or unschedulable. But if it doesn't pass, we know for sure that those configurations are not useful. They are not schedulable. We can know for sure that some timing constraints will be missed, will not be met. And that's why necessary schedulability tests can be useful. Likewise, we have sufficient schedulability tests if a configuration passing the test will be for sure schedulable, will be for sure inside of that rectangle. But configurations that don't pass a sufficient schedulability test, they can be unschedulable, but they can also be schedulable. So we don't know exactly uh, what to say about configurations that don't pass a sufficient schedulability test. And as you can guess, we will have exact schedulability tests if they can approximate exactly that rectangle. So they can discriminate exactly whether a configuration is inside or outside that rectangle. So we know some characteristics about those schedulability tests. We know when can we apply them. But 
what do they really look like? We can think about a system simulator as a schedulability test. So if we simulate the behavior of a system and we can simulate the configuration of a system and check whether the different tasks will meet their deadlines, a simulator can be at most a necessary schedulability test because the simulator can show us when a particular task overruns a deadline and misses a deadline. But if we simulate a system and we show that no task misses deadline in that particular run, we cannot really say that no, no task will ever miss a deadline even in the worst case. So if we run a simulation and we know that nothing misses its deadline, we know that it passed a necessary task and they can still be schedulable or unschedulable. But with a simulator, if we show that there is a, simu a scenario where there is a deadline miss, then we know that that's, that configuration is not schedulable. So simulation can be used as a schedulability test, but only as a necessary one. In most cases, what we actually do is to use analytical models. We use equations that try to approximate that area of the configuration space where the solutions are schedulable, and we use those equations to tell us if those particular configurations are schedulable or not. And we have analytical models that are necessary, we have analytical models that are sufficient, and we even have analytical models that are exact schedulability tests for specific kinds of problems. Let's go back to our example where we have our event-driven system with a single processor, and we will have a set of n independent sporadic tests, tasks tau1 to tau n, each one of them characterized by their periods, deadlines, and worst case execution time. And for us here, the decision for schedulability is that the tasks have to complete before their deadlines and their deadlines are equal to their period. The first test that I'm going to introduce is a task utilization based test. What is the task utilization? We can calculate the utilization of each task by dividing their worst case execution time over their period. And that actually means in the worst case, how much of the resource, how much of the single processor that task will use. And if we have a task here with a C of 10, its worst case execution time is 10, and its period T is 30, we have a utilization of one third, meaning that at most one third of the CPU will be used by that particular task. If we add the utilizations of all the tasks running in a particular CPU, I will know that the CPU cannot be overutilized. Otherwise, it's certainly uh, some task will miss a deadline. So a simple test checks whether the utilization of all tasks mapped to a particular CPU. In this case, we only have one, so we can go from one to N and check the utilization of all tasks. And it doesn't it has to be less than 100%. It has to be less than one. Otherwise, the system is overutilized and some task will not have enough CPU time to meet its deadline. Therefore, the, that configuration will not be schedulable. With this simple utilization test, we can already make some decisions about a particular scenario, a particular configuration. Let's look into an example. In this case, we have three tasks tasks tau1, tau2, and tau3 with the parameters shown in that table in the upper left part of the figure. And then in the lower part of the figure, we have the execution of those tasks according to a rate monotonic scheduling algorithm. So the task with the smaller period is given higher priority, that is tau3, and then the other tasks are given lower priorities according to their periods. And we can see that tau1 can only execute after tau3 and tau2 because tau1 has the lowest priority. And we can see that the worst case execution time of tau1 is 12. And it doesn't manage to get 12 units of time on the CPU before time equals 50 because its period is 50. So we can see that tau1 misses its deadline at that particular point. So we can see that with this set of parameters, with this uh, scheduling algorithm, and with this single CPU, the system is not schedulable. We can see that tau1 misses its deadline. But 
if we calculate the utilizations of all the tasks and add them together, we will see that the utilization is only 82%. What does that mean? That this test of the utilization telling me that if the utilization is more than 100%, my system is not schedulable. If the utilization is less than 100%, we cannot really tell. It could be schedulable and it could not be schedulable. So we can say that a utilization-based schedulability test is necessary but not sufficient. Let's move on to a different example and let's look at response time analysis as a schedulability test. And in this case, we are going to calculate the response time of each task, which is how much time will elapse in the worst case between the time a task is released and the time a task completes even when it has to share the CPU with other tasks. And we'll compare that worst case response time with its deadline and we will see if that task is schedulable or not. The response time analysis that has been introduced decades ago for a single processor system running on a rate monotonically scheduled single processor is this one. And it shows that I will have to add the interference of all tasks tau j that have a higher priority than the task tau i that I'm anal analyzing. And that interference will be added to the worst case execution time ci, and with that I'll have the worst case response time. How do I calculate that interference? I will calculate by having the maximum number of releases of tau j during the response time of tau i, so how many times tau j can interfere, and I'll add that interference which is proportional to the worst case execution time of tau j, which we have in the equation as cj. And then for every tau j, I'll add that to the response time, and by that I will be able to have the worst case response time of tau i. Notice that we have the ri term in both sides of the equation, and we need a, an iterative solution to get to the final value of ri. Coming back to our same example, we can see here that this equation can be applied to tau3, tau2, and tau1 to find what is the worst case response time of each one of them. Let's start with the higher priority task because that one suffers no interference whatsoever. So its worst case, worst case response time is equal to its worst case execution time. In this case, the C for tau3 is 10, so the R for tau3 is also 10. Straightforward. Now, let's move for tau2. Tau2 suffers interference from tau3 because it has lower priority than tau3, so my equation has to take into account that interference. And I have to solve the equation in an iterative way. I start with the first value that I can have. The worst case response time of tau2 will never be less than the worst case execution time of tau2, which is 10. So I start with 10, and then I start in the next iteration calculating the interference. So I feed the value of the response time in the previous iteration into the next iteration, and I start adding the values of the tasks that interfere on tau2. In this case, only tau3 interferes, so I only have one component there, and I have to then add the C for tau3 and the T for tau3. Once I solve that equation, which uses the ceiling function, 10 over 30 is going to give me 0 0.3, and the ceiling function will push that value to the next integer number, higher than 0 0.3, which will be 1, and then I'll have 1 time ta times 10 plus 10, 20, and that's the value that I have in the second, I the, the second iteration there and that value I'll feed into the next iteration. I'll have 20 over 30, I'll get 0 0.66. Ceiling function will push that to 1, and I'll get 20 again. And the moment that I have two iterations giving me the same value, I know that my iterative solution has converged, and I can know that the worst case response time for test tau2 is 20. Now we have to then calculate the response time for tau1. And in this case, I will have two components, because tau1 suffers interference from both tau2 and tau3. 
I start the same way from the worst case execution time of tau1 and I add that as the value of the first iteration into the second iteration and in the second iteration I'll have to get the parameters of both tau2 and tau3 because both of them cause interference on tau1. The good thing about this being in video, you can come back and look into those results more carefully and see how this is actually calculated. But this is textbook material in real-time systems, using response time analysis to calculate the response time of tasks scheduled using a rate monotonic scheduler over a single processor. At this point, we can see that the response time of each one of those tasks has been calculated, and we can see that tau1 has its worst case response time bigger than its period. Therefore, the schedulability test, this specific schedulability test can tell, you, tell us that that particular configuration is actually unschedulable. So for this particular kind of problem, response time analysis is necessary and sufficient. Therefore, it is an exact schedulability test. So at this point, we should know roughly what schedulability tests look like and which kind of answer do they give us. They can give us uh, answers that are either necessary, sufficient, or exact with regards to how a particular task uses the resource and would be schedulable, would be able to finish before its deadline, even in the worst case scenario. We have used this kind of schedulability tests to optimize systems at computation, communication, and process level. To do that, we have either reused or created schedulability tests for all those kinds of problems and used them to guide an optimization engine towards optimized system configurations. And we will go through examples of each one of those now. The first example is about the optimization of the allocation of software tasks over a multiprocessor system. And we want to make sure that with a, an optimized allocation, all the tasks will meet their deadlines. And this is work we have done in the Low Power Knock, Dream Cloud, and MCC projects. If we look into communicating tasks over a multiprocessor architecture, what we want is to find tasks that will finish their computation and communicate with other tasks or with memory controllers within their deadlines. So we need some sort of end-to-end -end schedulability task that will ch tell us that the computation and the inter-task communication inside of that multiprocessor system will complete by their deadlines. And we want that number of unschedulable tasks and communications to be zero at the end of my optimization. So we are using in this example an evolutionary algorithm that will start with an initial solution that has many unschedulable tasks and communications, but multiple generations later we hope that we'll get to a point where we have zero unschedulable tasks and communications. We therefore created an end-to-end -end schedulability test that puts together the response time of the task running on each one of the cores and just like the example that I've mentioned before, that response time will take into account the time the test uses the CPU to execute its code, even in the worst case scenario, but also the worst case interference that you'll suffer from other tasks of higher priority running on that same CPU. And then once we have that worst case response time of the task running on the CPU, we have to then calculate the worst case response time of the communication over the chip interconnect, that in our case is a network on chip. So packets will be sent from one core to another or to a memory controller, and they will suffer interference from other packets that have higher priority over the interconnect. So we will then use schedulability models that determine whether a task is schedulable if the task completes before the end-to-end -end deadline. But more than that, we want also the task plus the communication uh, response time to be less than that end-to-end -end deadline. And there is, of course, a relationship between these two schedulability tests. The response time of 
the task influences the schedulability test of the communication because it acts as a jitter to determine when the communication can actually start. So we need to use both equations to actually come up with the end-to-end -end schedulability test for a particular communicating task over a network on chip. And we use that equation to guide a genetic algorithm towards a fully schedulable solution. Let's take a look at some experiments. Here we have a plot which is fairly complicated to understand, so let's go step by step. It is trying to show the progress of the optimization of the task mapping of an autonomous vehicle application over a 16-core multiprocessor. We have two lines there, one blue and one purple. We will concentrate first on the blue line where we show with the square dots the number of unscalable tasks and communications for that particular application as we progress with the optimization over multiple generations on the X axis. So that line is plotted against the Y axis on the left hand side of the figure. The second blue line is actually measuring the dissipated power for the best solution of each of the generations. And it's measured against the scale on the Y axis on the right hand side of the figure. And in this case, we can see that the energy dissipation doesn't change very much. It kind of oscillates up and down, but it is roughly at the same level from the early generations all the way to the late generations. Because in this particular case, we were not trying to optimize that. We were only trying to optimize the unscalable tasks and communication packets. And we can see that we start with uh, 13, 14 unscalable tasks at the first generation. And as we evolved, we can get that back down to 5, then to 3, and then to 0 after 11 generations of our optimization. So very quickly, we could find a fully schedulable mapping of tasks to cores in this particular system, guided by that end-to-end -end schedulability test. If we consider not only the schedulability, but also the energy dissipation, and that's now we are looking into the purple lines, we will see that our optimization algorithm can still find a fully schedulable solution, but it takes much longer. It takes 39 generations to find a fully schedulable solution compared to 11 in the previous case. But in the line at the top of the figure, the purple line at the top of the figure, now you can see that we have significantly reduced the energy dissipation. So by using multiple guidances for the optimization process, we can optimize multiple objectives, but it will take longer to optimize each one of those objectives, which is, of course, natural. So, using this sort of approach, we have made several contributions towards improving and creating new schedulability tests, and we have presented this into the top conferences in real time and design automation systems, and we also have done some contributions on simulation, and how to use simulation, how to make simulation faster, but still useful as a necessary schedulability test. And we have used this approach to successfully optimize multiple kinds of configurations, such as task mapping, just like in this example, also optimizing energy dissipation, multi-mode operations when systems have different kinds of tasks and parameters at each one of the modes, but we also don't want to change very much the configurations between modes, only when necessary to meet timing constraints. We also looked into uh, minimizing the number of priority levels that you might need, also security and memory footprint. And we have published this in a wide variety of conferences. Now, let's move on to a different layer, to a different level. On the communication level, we have used the similar approach to try to optimize the traffic of message flows over specific networks by improving the configuration, such as routing tables and guaranteed throughput slot allocations in networks, so that most critical message flows in networks will meet their deadlines. We have done work in high-density wired mesh networks for airflow sensing. We have done some research in the wireless domain for industrial networks based on wireless heart. We have one paper as part of the regular program 
of the conference pre presented by Gustavo Künzel. That is some work that he has done together with us in New York. And we have also done some work with the Airtight protocol, which is uh, providing mixed criticality support for wireless networks based on the IEEE 802.15.4 protocol. And I will explain that particular work in a little bit more detail here. So what we want is to allow wireless networks to have timing guarantees for the packets even in the worst case scenario. And in the worst case scenario in wireless networks, it means that we have to take into account the fact that the wireless channel is imperfect. So there will be situations where packets will not be correctly transmitted. There will be situations that the environment will pose interference on the, char on the wireless channel and packets will not be able to be delivered. So we require a fault model to tell us what is the worst level of faults that we can experience. And in this work, we allowed this fault model to be uh, dis to discriminate different criticality levels. So we can have different ways to model faults in systems that are more critical and in parts of the system, in subsystems that are more critical so that they have to cope with harsher faults while some other parts of the system, they don't have to cope with faults that are so harsh. And we created schedulability models that take that into account. And what we want is to make sure that under normal conditions, uh, all levels of criticality of the system must meet, must meet all the deadlines, but in harsh conditions of the channel, only those highly critical parts of the system must meet all the deadlines because those are the only ones that need to be certified to be working at such harsh levels uh, of the channel. And we have a case study on a 36 node network handling 40 message flows. 25% of those are those that are highly critical that should be certified even when the system are in harsh conditions. And we allow the evaluation to consider a single wireless channel or multiple channels that the nodes of the network can use. But always with the constraint that nodes can only transmit and receive over a single channel, even if we are considering a multi-channel network. And what, our, what, what we wanted to do is to evolve slot tables for those nodes so that the guaranteed throughput allocated to each one of the nodes will be enough that in the normal conditions, all the messages that those nodes have to root will meet their deadlines, even in the worst case. And in harsher channel conditions, the high critical messages will meet their deadlines, even in the worst case scenario. And here are some results. Again, the plots are a little bit difficult to understand. Let's go step by step and look into the single channel on the left hand side plot. On the X axis, we again have the generation number, so the progress of our optimization. And on the Y axis, we have the proportion of the messages and packets that will meet their deadlines at each stage of the optimization. And we want them to reach 100%. And 100% there means that 100% of the packets will meet their deadlines in the regular scenario, and that is from 0 to 50% of that axis, and then from 50 to 100%, it is only those, the percentage of those that are highly critical, whether they would meet their deadlines. The multiple colorful lines are different uh, optimization runs that we did with the evolutionary algorithm. And as we run, we get very, uh, slowly sometimes to that 50% level, meaning all the messages will meet their deadlines in the regular case. And then when you see those lines shooting up all the way to 100% is when we have found configurations where the, all the messages meet their deadlines in the regular case and also in the harsher case for the most critical messages, for the ones that are highly critical and need to be certified with a harsher channel. And we can see that in most cases, uh, we can find 100% uh, schedulability in those configurations. But when you see lines that go parallel to the X axis in that 50% line of the Y axis, it means those are situations where we could only find solutions where uh, the tasks are schedulable in the regular scenario, but not in the harsher scenario. 
Does it mean that I will not find a situation where they're fully schedulable in the regular and the harsher scenario? We don't know. These are heuristics, so we don't know how far from optimal we are. Those are just the results that we could get over multiple evolutionary runs. And we can see that in most cases, we can get those evolutions converging to fully scalable solutions. If we look into the multi-channel case, we can see that it's even easier for us to find fully scalable solutions. And only in a few cases, we had difficulties in finding 100% uh, scalable solutions because with more channels to choose we have actually three different uh, slot tables to evolve and we'll have more bandwidth to make those nodes uh, route the different messages uh, efficiently towards their destinations before their deadline. And now I'll quickly go through an example of the third layer which is at the process level, at the physical process. And in this case it's work that we have done in the Sapphire project where we had a number of industrial partners in the manufacturing domain. So what they wanted was to optimize uh, production plans for uh, factories so that the manufacturing orders that they will receive will be done with the lowest cost, with the lowest make span and with the lowest energy dissipation. So we have different case studies such as the production optimization in chemical plants, the optimization of industrial kitchens, and the optimization of uh, EDM cutting of metal parts for automotive and aerospace industry. And the one example that I'll quickly go through is the example on metal cutting parts, which was done with a Spanish company called Ona. And in this example here, they wanted us to analyze if they have a number of time sensitive orders and they will have to be cut over a pool of 12 machines. And these machines have three different sizes, so small, medium and large machines. And each machine has four operating modes, which uh, allow them to exploit the trade off between cost in terms of energy and how fast the, the, the parts are cut. So what they wanted us to analyze was to minimize the make span and maximize the production profit by having the machines to cut the parts quickly enough, but without using too much energy. And they asked us to do what if scenarios in the sense of should they use and provide services to all the orders they have received from their customers. And that's what we showed there in blue or if they could select the best, most profitable orders and concentrate on those and try to get those delivered as soon as possible with the minimum energy cost and just reject a few of the, a few, a few of the orders, which would not be as profitable. And that's what we showed in the red lines and box plots. So we managed to show them for different sizes of those orders that it always made sense to be more selective and pick only some of the orders and then use the machines in their most uh, energy efficient way and deliver orders by their deadlines in the most efficient way rather than serving all the orders. So we again used optimization algorithms to do that and running those optimization algorithms in this case over cloud platforms so that we could actually cover a much larger uh, configuration space and we were guided by necessary schedulability models only because for this sort of system it's impossible and infeasible to have uh, schedul schedulability models that are sufficient or exact. At this point of my talk I've covered uh, a number of optimization activities we have done and in all cases we always had a schedulability test or we created a schedulability test ourselves and when we created them and when we used existing ex schedulability tests, they were mostly manually derived by researchers and practitioners, which is error prone process. We can look into the literature and we'll see that there were schedulability tests that were proposed and they were found to be wrong after a while. And for very complex systems, this is really impractical. Sometimes we cannot really get to a schedulability test, we sometimes cannot really make sure that that schedulability test is actually correct. So what we tried to do was an approach to semi-automatic synthesis of schedulability tests. And we decided to use exactly the same approach to use 
a search heuristic and to use a fitness function that will guide that search heuristic towards uh, good scalability tests. That's what we did. So instead of having here uh, individual configurations of a system that we are trying to optimize, we have individual scalability tests that we are trying to optimize. And we model each one of them according to a grammar. We kind of know which way equations of scalability tests are composed. They usually have a term for response time. They usually have a term for worst case execution time. They usually have a ceiling function. They usually have something to do with periods. They usually have something to do with uh, a sum over a set. So we kind of know that we can create a grammar and we can uh, model an equation that could look like a scalability test. And then we want to evolve those multiple candidates those multiple equations into equations that are good for a specific problem. How do we do that? I'll bring this back. We already know that we can have a set of uh, configurations and I can have necessary, sufficient and exact schedulability tests as we have seen before. But let's randomly create an equation. And what would we get out of a randomly created equation? probably something that is not really useful, probably something that will not tell me if a particular configuration passes that test, whether it is scalable or not. And what is outside that configuration, we know, don't know if it's scalable or not. It's just a random equation after all. So very unlikely that by randomly put together an equation, that test will become useful. But if I have a way to simulate multiple configurations of my system. And as we have seen, a simulation can be, can approximate a necessary schedulability test. So with simulation, I can have uh, scenarios that I will know for sure they're unschedulable. And those are the ones that I'm showing there as brown circles, because for sure, when I simulated those scenarios, those configurations, there would, there were tasks that missed a deadline. So I know that those configurations are unscalable. And then there are simulation scenarios that I'm simulating configurations that I couldn't observe any deadline miss. And if I couldn't observe, it means that those solutions are real, really, un really scalable and there will never be a deadline miss. But there are also the possibility that I just didn't simulate for long enough that occasionally they would uh, miss a deadline. I just didn't simulate long enough for that to happen. So those that I'm showing in blue are the solutions that my simulators didn't show any deadline miss. They can be scalable. They can be unscalable. We don't really know with simulator. But the ones that we know are unscalable can be useful for us to evaluate how good our arbitrary test is. So if my arbitrary test is telling that some of those solutions are schedulable. When in reality we know they are not, we can approximate that as a fitness function for that arbitrary test. And if I use my regular approach to mutate and create other randomly created arbitrary tests by mutating and doing crossover of that test, I will be able to pick the ones that give me the best fitness, meaning pick the ones that didn't say that many of those unschedulable uh, scenarios that simulation told me they are unscalable, this arbitrary test didn't really include many of them as uh, scenarios that passed the test. And I can keep evolving my tests by doing that. I can even change my simulation scenarios to try to maximize the number of counterexamples for that current test so that I do some more mutations and I'll keep pushing those tests into the area of schedulable configuration. So I'm trying to evolve a test and try to make that test that started completely random as a test that has that is becoming more and more close to the necessary tests that we can use and become more useful for the optimization tasks that we have seen earlier in this talk. We have done this and we have done a case study with a CAN bus in an automotive system, which is a scalability test that really exists, it has been well studied. But we wanted to check whether we can evolve tests that are good enough for that problem and we managed to get pretty good 
synthetically synthesized tests using our uh, approach. And this has been published in the last RTSS conference, which is the top conference in real-time systems area. So at this point, I can conclude my talk and say that Schedulability tests can be used efficiently and effectively to guide the optimization of real-time embedded and cyber-physical systems. And we have done this at the computing, communication, and process levels. We have done this in problems with, of industrial relevance, such as automotive, aerospace, manufacturing. And if suitable schedulability tests are not available, and that is the case and that will continue to be the case, we think that semi-automatic generation is a possibility and we have made some progress in that direction. Thank you very much for your attention.